Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute. And I want to welcome you to our March, no, April, April. Conservative April. Women's April. Network April. lunch. April. I'm way behind. Special thank you to Bridget Wagner, vice president of the Heritage Foundation. Heritage and the Luce Institute have now been this wonderful partnership of CWN lunches for 18 years. That's a long time. Now I'm delighted to introduce today's Conservative Women's Network speaker, Mercedes Schlepp, we go by Mercy. She's a columnist for the Washington Times and a Fox News contributor. As the co-founder of Cove Strategies, she develops and implements media strategy for corporate and nonprofit organizations. And she also co-hosts the weekly radio show, CPAC 365, with her husband and ACU chairman, a Matt Schlapp on Cirrus XM Patriot. Not a one, two, five. <laughs> <laughs> she makes frequent television appearances as a Republican strategist and has written for US News and World Report, The Daily Caller, and The Hill on a variety of topics, including immigration, Hispanic women, and women's issues, as well as foreign and domestic policy. A first generation Cuban American and raised in Miami, Florida, she's fluent in Spanish and also provides political commentary for Univision, Telemundo, CNN, and Espanol, and National Spanish Radio. How's that? Espanol. <laughs> Inspired by her father, who was held as a political prisoner in Fidel Castro's Cuba in the 1960s, Mercy discovered her passion for politics at a young age. Her father's experience in Cuba gave her a clear understanding of the need to protect freedom and democracy in the United States and around the world. Mercy is the former director of specialty media for President George W. Bush in the White House, where she served as a spokesman for the president. She's worked both local and national political campaigns, including the 2000 and the 2004 presidential campaign for President George W. Bush, and she worked at the Republican National Committee where she hosted an online show in both English and Spanish and interviewed national surrogates on current events. Native of Miami, Florida, a graduate of Florida International University, and she received a master's degree from the George Washington University. She said her hobbies are her five kids. She also, a hobby is tennis and sleeping. <laughs> I love it. She and her husband, Matt, live in Virginia with their five daughters. The oldest is 13. God bless you. And she would have been here if she didn't have school. In fact, she would have skipped school to come here. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Mercy Schlapp. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's really wonderful that you all are here. And I, I do feel like we should just all cuddle up and just like have a cup of coffee while we're, we're going through this. But uh, I really do want to thank M Michelle, Bridget, Claire Booth Luce, Policy Institute, and the Heritage Foundation for this, this kind invitation. I mean, both organizations have such a long standing history of upholding and promoting conservative uh, principles. And so it, it, I feel right at home here. It's, it's, it's like family. And, and I have to tell you, I've made friends here at the Heritage Foundation. There's a show called To the Contrary. It's on PBS. It's a woman's show. I don't, I don't know how many people watch it. And it's one of the places where I got a, a bit of my start in terms of learning how to debate liberals. It's this very liberal host, Bonnie Herbe, two liberal women, two conservative women. And so every week, they'd send out the list of people who were going to be on the show. And I would always scroll down and be like, oh, thank God, Genevieve Wood is going to be there. Because I knew that if anyone was prepared to make, to, to, to make the conservative case and understand how to explain conservative principles, it was going to be Genevieve. And I know Bridget does that as well. Uh, so I felt very, uh, it was interesting because it was, those, and there was difficult times in, in that show, and it really challenged me to think of how to become an effective communicator in this very secular, anti-conservative world that we're living in. Uh, there was one lady, I'll tell you a story, who was five months pregnant. She uh, worked for NARAL, and she said that her biggest accomplishment, and this was on air, was the fact that she was able to, uh, to ensure that the ban of 20-week abortions uh, would not come to light in Washington, D.C. And I remember that I think I had like a moment of shock on air where I was just like, you're, you're, wait, 
you're 20 weeks pregnant and you're going into Washington, D.C. And, and basically ensuring that this ban of 20 weeks doesn't go into place. I'm like, don't you feel this baby move within you? And, and it really became almost this personal discussion. And I felt very sad for her. And it's funny because we're in this in this generation right now where it's you know we're we're fighting. There's a lot of fights with liberals. They don't want to talk to us. You know we don't necessarily want to talk to them. They're they and but I think part of what we're going to learn, I think, as conservative women, is um, you know almost like praying for them, like knowing that we have to, in a way, um, understand where they're coming from. Obviously, defend our principles, but understand clearly. Um, you know, that goodness, have they lost their way? And how, when you're making these logical arguments, how you can kind of maybe bring them back. I remember Bonnie, who, uh, who is very liberal, big, big liberal feminist. She came to me one day, because of course I was probably bringing like one of the kids in and it's a baby, two, I had to breastfeed. It was like kid number four or five, I don't remember. And, uh, and she, goes, she goes, how do you do it? You're always so jolly and happy. And I was like, I, and I was like, because I'm, I'm, I have this foundation. It's my faith. It's my family. It's my country. It's my conservative values. It's that brings joy to my life, and it's a very full life. And and you know, as you all go through your different stages in your life, you realize that there's several things that s stick with you, and that's your family, that's your faith, and that's your conservative principles. And you know, I today I I, I th just brings to mind uh, a conservative hero, someone who, who passed away this week, Cato Byrne, who was one of my personal uh, conservative heroes. And I know she worked here at the Heritage Foundation and at the National Review. And she was just, just a brilliant lady with this amazing voice and this, this laughter you just could never forget. And I, I have a feeling she's up there in heaven right now debating with St. Peter's going, okay, I know I got to get into heaven right now, but you know, let's get this straight. What's going, what can we do from up here to uh, impact what's happening in America? You know, I just could hear her. I could just listen to her say that, but she made an interesting quote, which stuck, which really stuck to me. And it said, it was in the Washington Post. She said, I learned more about self-worth, ambition, and opportunity from my conservative parents and Catholic nuns than I ever did from Eleanor Smeal and Gloria Steinem. And I say this because you have all these feminists out there who want to claim womanhood. They want to claim us. They want to claim all women. But it's really like the unsung heroes in our lives. It's like my mother, who I don't think she even knew she was conservative by label, but who, you know, I always talk about my father and his heroic story of being a freedom fighter in Cuba, but it was my mother who married my father while he was in jail and he was fighting communism, came to the United States by herself with her mother pregnant with my, my older brother. And she's very, and, and she came to America and raised her kids in, in a very stable, loving environment, but ensured that we practiced our faith freely, that we understood why freedom in America is so precious, because they had to leave everything, their homes, their businesses, to come to America. And, and it all taken away by an overreaching dictatorship uh, that has no re who had no respect for freedom of speech, uh, freedom of, pro of property rights, no respect for freedom of religion in this nation. And so for my mother, who is in a way, you know, she is my unsung hero because she taught me the value of family and she taught me the value of faith and she taught me the value of loving America because America is so unique and it's so much ingrained in democracy and debate and discussion. And, and I think her... Her life has been, for me, just what I've taken in and, and been able to say, okay, I want my children to have that as well. And so when you have the government in your schools, in your public schools, telling you how you have to think or how you have to behave um, in terms, and, and, the, and the liberals trying to be this bigger moral authority, you know, it gets old because you have to push back. You know, I call it, especially the liberal women, they're like the mean girls club. They really are. You know, what do they do? What did Hillary Clinton do throughout her campaign? She called us names. I mean, 
how many times did you feel you had to be kind of quiet and be like, oh, well, I'm going to vote for Trump or, you know, I'm a conservative. How many times do you feel that way on college campuses, in your businesses, in your, in, in, you know, at birthday parties, you know, it, it's, I'm tired of it. Like, I'm tired of being quiet. I really am. And I realized this kid, I, and I was at a, my daughter does theater, one of the girls, the 13 year old, um, in addition to being a little bit obsessed with politics, but that's okay. And uh, she, you know, they're, they're pretty liberal. And it was after the Trump victory, and they were very depressed, right? All the moms. In fact, I'm surprised they didn't cancel practice at this community theater. And, you know, this woman came up to me, she goes, I'm a conservative, you know, and I really, you know, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. And, and I really was kind of saddened by it because the liberals, they wear it on their sleeves. In fact, I think they tattoo it on their arms. Mm -hmm. They wear it on their sleeves. They are proud and bold. And then you, they go to the Women's March. And then you have Ashley Judd calling women nasty. That's a horrible message to send to women and to young women. Um, you know, I don't want my five daughters thinking that they have to be nasty. I don't want my five daughters to think that they have to go and blow up the White House. I mean, it's very, it's a lot, it, they're lost and it's sad. And what I love about conservative women is the wholeness, the internal beauty of conservative women. It's the, not only the intellectual capability, the understanding of what our founding fathers stood for, of the, of the building of our constitution, of the fights that they themselves had trying to figure out how much do, power do we give to the federal government? How much power do we give to the states? Uh, the, the idea that our nation decided that they were gonna stand against a king in, in, in Great Britain and become something unique something that we have not seen in our civilization. And I, I find with conservative women is that our intellectualism is based on that constitution. It's based on time-tested values. It's also the spirituality of conservative women that I just love and admire. And it's because I think we're okay to talk about faith. And I'm not saying all conservative women are you know, are religious or, but the idea that there is this freedom, this religious liberties, the idea that we want to protect other people's rights to practice their religion freely or have their children be homeschooled or have their children go to a Catholic or Christian school because that's what they want them to grow up in. It's about empowering our families. And so I, I find that the faith component is so incredibly important. And in the Bible, it says, and I remember, and if I'd be Baptist, I would know the exact, like, Galatians 3, but I'm Catholic, so of course I don't know the Bible by heart. But the Bi you know, in the story, it said, you will be, I read it, I literally opened the Bible and just was like, okay, I'm going to read that. And it said, you will be attacked for confronting the resistance. You will be attacked for confronting the resistance. And I was like, goodness gracious, that's so telling right now. Because what's the word that the Democrats are using? Resistance. resistance. So they are so, they are feeling so empowered. They feel a resistance. But what they're doing is that, yeah, they feel like they're the victims, but they're attacking us. The other thing I love about the wholeness of the conservative woman is the, the empathetic value. This idea that we are empathetic towards others, that we want, we value the individual that each individual is different, that we do not need to be thrown into a group, that you, your ideas and your talents, that is what contributes to the greatness of the conservative movement. But yeah, I think there's a big question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we being misunderstood? Are we not sufficiently communicating our message to the nation? I mean, we are a powerful movement, but yet it's like sometimes I feel we're not being listened to. Sometimes I feel like they are much louder on the other side than we are. They wear those silly pink hats. I mean, who came up with that idea? I mean, that's pathetic. And we're just trying to stay afloat, try to express our views. And you know, it's funny because they always tell me, you know, you've got these five kids, you've got Matt Schlapp as a husband, who's a full-time job. And uh, you know, why do you, you, you know, why do you do what you do? And I, and I feel that in a way, you know, I really feel that it's, you know, God's 
God's will of saying, you know, mercy, you got to talk. You got to share what you think. You got to share what you know. You know, you're in the swamp. You see things happening, and you can express it in a way that comes from a conservative standpoint that not many people get to do. But you all have to empower yourselves to do that as well, because we need, excuse me, we need to be loud. I mean, we need to be loud. We need to speak up. We should not be silenced. I think what we're seeing right now on the college campuses is devastating. Devastating. The fact that conservative, I'm thinking I'm going to take Bridget and Michelle, and you guys should all come along. We should go over to Berkeley right now. <laughs> Can Heritage fly us over? <laughs> um, seriously, and stand in that, that, that same spot where in 1964, the free speech movement was launched. I, I, they literally, these students protested, uh, over a thousand students protested, basically are demanding that they would stop this ban on political, act on political, allowing for political activity and for freedom of speech and academic freedom. College campuses should be the first place that you should have liberals and conservatives having this fight and having this discussion and figuring out what issues matter in America. When, when I was at FIU and, you know, I came from a very traditional family. My mother was like, you're going to stay home. You're going to go to college. You can't, you know, live in a dorm or anything. You're going to live at home and, uh, and you're going to marry a Cuban boy, which I didn't marry a Cuban boy. And I married the gringo, and she couldn't pronounce his last name because they, she, the, in the Cubans, they were like, so is it slap? Because they can't do the sh sound. And I was like, no, mom, it's slap. So she'd go, oh, shrimp, slap. And I'm like, yes, we got it. And he's like the tallest, biggest German person in the whole room of these like Cuban shrimps. So, um, uh, so anyway, so... Interestingly enough, when I was there, and it was, it was a little frustrating for me because I really felt like I wanted to do something a little broader in my life and not marry a Cuban boy. Not that Cuban boys are bad. They're, they're good guys. They're just not for me. And uh, at FIU, they invited the communists to come from Cuba. Okay, And it was interesting because the president at the time, Mitch Medik, is actually a Cuban refugee. Very successful. Went to MIT, became the president of the university. And, he, and they invited the Cuban communists to come. And... They spoke, we went, and it was very hard from a, an emotional standpoint because you know of the atrocities that these individuals commit in their country. You know the fact that you yourself cannot go to Cuba and speak. You cannot do the same thing. Yet they can come and talk about the wonders of the communist system and how much better their healthcare system is than ours and how America is evil. And so that's what they can do in America. And I remember we had this really heated discussion, and I remember it was an emotional day for us on campus. But it was America. It is not safe space. It is freedom of speech space. And that is what is so important. And that is why I worry where our young individuals who are being influenced in these colleges and, and, and not being challenged because we have to put them in saran wrap in a bubble. I mean, what is going on? It is exactly there in the college campuses that these discussions need to be happening on a daily basis, where liberals and conservatives can sit down and fight it out, because that is what we need. As we start seeing even more polarization in, in our politics, it's becoming harder for things to get done. And I do believe that it's important for us to listen to the other side, while we might disagree completely. and. But, but talk and educate and explain, well, you know, they, 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 they might not agree with Donald Trump on anything, because right now they obviously don't agree with Donald Trump on anything. But the fact is, is that if we can find some common ground on certain issues, which I don't think we'll do, in, especially in this environment, but I think it's important to listen to the other side and debate it and say why maybe our side has better solutions for America. Because we're all trying to get there. We're all trying to get to the point that we focus on helping America continue to prosper and grow. But I think for conservatives, it's about ensuring that we have those, uh, that foundation in place, that conservative foundation in place, where we support economic uh, prosperity, growth, ensure that we have strong national security. But of course, we have a big situation here. The resistance is not only coming from the liberals, it's coming from the media. 
It was interesting because at 538, Nate Silver came out and said that only 7% of journalists are Republican. 7% of journalists are Republican. That means that if you're a journalist right now, you are living also in what they call pro-Clinton county, which means you are in a bubble, in a complete bubble if you're a journalist. And so if you ever wonder why all these political pundits got it wrong and they were sitting in New York and they were sitting in Washington and they were going, He's, President Trump is going to lose dramatically. There's no way. And uh, very critical of, of President Trump as a candidate. And everyone's saying, how could you not, as a woman, vote for Hillary Clinton? I don't know how many times you heard that. I heard it a dozen times. I was over at a soccer field, and this woman came up to me. She's like, how could you ever vote for that man? And you know, Hillary Clinton should be the first woman president. And I'm like, sorry, dude, I don't vote on gender. I vote on, I want a supreme, strong Supreme Court with good conservatives on the Supreme Court. I want someone who's going to ensure that we uh, can unleash economic growth in America through tax reform, and Obamacare has got to go. Very clear. There's three things. Why? Because it wasn't on the personality or the character flaws of the candidates. It was on, on the issues, definitely on the issues. And so the conservative media outlets are incredibly important. And I say this, as, as especially to the, um, the, the, the youth, is that reading the Daily Signal, listening to XM Patriot Radio, uh, be, reading what the conservative media, what they are writing, going over to the Heritage Foundation, getting the policy information that you need to arm yourself with the information that you need, it's incredibly important. But I also encourage you to read the, the, the news on the left. You need to know what they are thinking at all times and what they are plotting. Uh, it, it's unreal to see how, and I think part of it has been because of the 24-hour news cycle, how opinion journalism has taken this whole new life. You have seen the, the destruction or the deconstruction of the traditional hierarchy of journalism. What used to be objective journalism is now not the case. It is very much, uh, on both sides, moving to a more polarized media situation which has its positives and its negatives. But I think as conservatives, I do believe it's important to understand what the other side is thinking. And their thinking is very clear. They believe that President Trump should not be president, that he, should, he is not the rightful elected leader of our nation. They believe that uh, you know, he's buddy-buddy with Putin and that there was definitely collusion. And it's not about fair journalism anymore. It's not about objective journalism anymore. And then when you watch CNN, where you put like five Democrats against a Republican that maybe is a Republican, but who voted for Hillary Clinton, that's not fair news. And that's during the day. That's daytime news. That's not even like nighttime stuff going on. I mean, nighttime is a lot of opinion journalism. And so I, I think, you know, what I realized is when I was traveling during the campaign to different areas, you know, I remember that I really realized, I go, gosh, we do really live in a bubble here. I mean, it is crazy. First of all, we have these counties that haven't been hit hard on the economic recession side. I mean, they call it Charles Murray in his book, Coming Apart, called it the super zip codes. And so it's this attachment from what else, what, ha what is happening in the rest of America. So what do I do? I call my sister who's down in Miami, who's 30 something years old. And I say, and she's not political. I'm like, what do you think is happening? She goes, Trump, he's going to win this primary. I mean, this is a kid, person who's not political. Law. She goes, all my 30-something-year-old business people, they're kind of like small business people, they like his economic stuff. They're going to vote for Trump. And then I remember, uh, you know, right after when it was probably less than a month out, I went down to Miami, and I asked this evangelical Christian lady, just fabulous, and, she, and I said, Lourdes, what? I'm like, these numbers in Florida, they look awful. I mean, there's no way. I don't know how we're going to pull it off. We're down by 4%. I was reading all the RNC data analysis. I mean, I was total geek, like total nerd, political nerd. And she looks at me, she goes, he's going to win the election. I was like, what? He's going to win Florida. I'm like, how is he going to win Florida? She goes, he's just going to win it. So I called Grandma Sue over in Kansas, and I said, Grandma, Matt's mom, what's happening? Well, obviously, Kansas would go for Trump, but she's like, I really think he's going to pull this thing off. I'm like, these are the political pundits we should have on air, not the rest of the, you know, all of us that were like doom and gloom the whole time. But why? Because it, it showed that, uh, that Americans were tired of what the media was telling them. They were tired. They were like, no more. 
We're, and, and you had the silent vote, vote. You had those individuals who once again had to be quiet and say, I voted for Donald Trump, but don't tell anyone, you know? And isn't that sad that in America we, we're, we've been silenced in that way? So I think it's important to understand that, you know, the media is complicated. Uh, you know, I get to work on Fox, so I, I don't get as beat up as my husband does on CNN and MSNBC. But I think one of the biggest challenges, and I saw this particularly with Matt, and there was a point Matt would be like, did you see that hit? And I was like, I can't watch your hits. They drive me crazy. Is that they would call him names, because that's where the liberals go. You're a racist, you're a sexist. It's pretty basic. So they want to they want to silence you in that way. And, you know, we're looking now into the into the 100 days, the media is obsessed about the 100 days. They're like, oh, this is a report card. He's failing. It's awful. Like, they are just going to take him down. But for conservatives, I think we should be very pleasant. We should be we're pleasantly surprised. Starting off with the Neil Gorsuch pick and the confirmation process. President, who I won't say is necessarily an ideological conservative but, you know, my husband always goes, his instincts are conservative in some ways. Not in all ways, but in some ways. And he got it right on the Gorsuch nomination. And the, I think he very much stood to his word. Secondly, he has the most conservative cabinet that we've seen. Probably, uh, Bridget, you can argue with me, Reagan there, right around there, all there, in the bubble. Good. So, um, and... I think when you're looking at the fact that he's, from a national security standpoint, have gone from the weakened foreign policy approach of a, a President Obama to a peace through strength, similar to Ronald Reagan, to the fact that he has said, you cross a red line and we are going to respond, that is the type of American leadership we need to see. And I think when we're looking at the case of North Korea, and it's now they're all flipping out because he said that there could be a major, major conflict with North Korea, is that... It is dangerous. It is, I think, the, the one area that we need to keep a very close eye on. I think that, obviously, the relationship that President Trump is building with the Chinese president has been very helpful, uh, but I'm not sure if it's going to be enough. Uh, you know, this man is crazy in North Korea. It's like having a toddler with a bunch of toy weapons, and it's incredibly unnerving. He executes his own family. He executes people who don't agree with him. Uh, you know, the repression in North Korea is, I mean, the, it's the most isolated country in the whole world. I mean, they, they will threaten to kill you. They will, um, it, it's, just, it's just unreal. It's just unreal. And the fact is, is that there's this sense, like the United Nation, please, what are they going to do? More sanctions, more resolutions that the North Koreans decide to defy? They don't, they, they're not going to follow the rules. They're not, they don't play by the rules. And, and it's interesting because North Korea is intricately involved with providing uh, weapons over to Syria, to Assad. It is all this interconnection with these rogue dictators, and it's scary stuff. And the fact is, is that according to the American intelligence is that, you know, they could have nuclear weapon ready to launch the United States in four years. And that's a reality. And, and it, I think it's going to be right now the most... A critical, complex international conflict that we're going to see in our time. I mean, and then that doesn't include, you know, Putin and Russia, which we can go into a whole lengthy discussion about that. I think on the on on the side of border now on border security, it's been fascinating to watch. I saw John Kelly on one of the shows. He's the Homeland Security Director, and he kept. Like he was just like banging his head, going, "Why will these sanctuary cities? Why don't they accept our help to get a criminal out of their community?" And it's interesting because the the sanctuary cities argument, it's just I find it disturbing that these mayors are basically pushing back the help of the federal government and, and enforcing the immigration laws. I mean, it's completely disturbing. This is they the liberals have decided that on immigration that we're immoral on this issue, that how could we take out illegal aliens and move them back, you know, or deport them to their countries. In fact, some of these countries don't even take back these illegal Im immigrants. So it becomes very, very, very problematic. But what have we seen? President Trump, as opposed to what a Hillary Clinton would have done, who talked about open borders and more open borders, we've seen illegal crossings Border crossings decreased 93%. This is without building the wall. This is without building the wall. And so we've seen this, 
this move towards the fact that because he speaks in a, the way that he speaks, he it, it's like taking action without necessarily building the wall. The wall itself is complicated. Uh, we know that uh, Speaker Ryan, they're pushing back and they don't necessarily want to move forward on the funding for building the wall. So uh, we'll see what happens on, on that end. Um, so I think when we look at 100 days, I don't want you to look at 100 days. I want you to look beyond. I want you to look 1,000 days. I want you to look at the fact that Congress is complicated. We have a lot of internal fighting between the GOP, a lot of division within the GOP. And you know, when you even look at Ronald Reagan himself, he focused on tax and spending cuts in the first 100 days. Neither were, were passed till August of 1981. Obamacare took over 187 days to get passed. So let's be realistic. I think here in Washington, we understand that things are slow. But I think for this president, he's very impatient and he wants immediate action, which I don't blame him, of course. Then to add on to that is the Obamacare regulations, which the rolling back, the fact the tax reform bill, these are all things that I think for the president, one of the lessons he's learned with the health care reform bill is you got to lay out your principles first and then hand it over to Congress to build out the legislation. We didn't see that with the health care reform bill. That, I think, ended up, a dis obviously, it was a disaster, a legislative setback, I think, uh, it, from the sense that Speaker Ryan, who pr basically promised him he would have those votes and it all fell apart, um, reflected very poorly, not only on Speaker Ryan, but on the administration. So I think he's learned his lesson by releasing these tax reform principles, and I wish he would have done that in the first place with health care reform. You know, so it's been a rough start. They got to move on personnel. They got to hire people. I know there's a lot of great folks from Heritage Foundation who are over there at the administration, but they are moving way too slowly on getting their people in. And that's why um, that, I believe, is also incredibly problematic. Uh, but I'm hopeful. I am. I think, uh, you know, I think obviously during the primary, so many of us, our own family was so divided on to who they were going to support. And there was obviously more candidates who were more conservative than others. But I think when... Uh, I do believe that when President Trump picked Mike Pence, it made a, a big difference. He sent a very clear message to conservatives that he wants them to be part of the team. And I think you look at several individuals on his staff, although there's obviously the soap opera going th happening there, that are in his ear basically saying, look, we've got to defund Planned Parenthood. We've got to stay clear and focused on, you know, on what's on the pro-life amendments and on the pro-life appointments. And, and, and I think he's listening. And I think that says a lot about uh, President Trump and his willingness to recognize that it was because of the conservatives to a large part that he was, in addition to independents who switched over to Obama, who stood, you know, who stuck by him and helped him get elected. Um, you know, I have to say that I, I, I'm, I feel that the work that you all are doing and the, 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 that, that don't, don't underestimate yourself. I mean, it's so important to get involved in your communities. And I know you probably hear this all the time. Find your mentors, especially if you're young. I think I worry a lot about, especially now being a mom, and Grandma Sue tells me all the time, she's like, I'm so concerned about our future. But I worry about the youth. I worry that, that you know, they really are going to fall in love with the Bernie Sanders and the socialist mentality and the idea that government is the answer to every problem. And it's so important for us, especially as conservative women, to say, look, liberal women, you don't own us. You don't own the word women. We are part of this fight. We have our own voice. We have our own principles. And stop using the word women altogether, because guess what? We are not homogeneous. We, um, we, we are different. And, and we're proud of who we are. And I think that uh, it's very important to stand up, speak up. And you know, I think as in honor of Cato Byrne, she did it so brilliantly, but um, you know it's important to listen to those conservative voices and and just arm yourself with the material that you need to to fight the good fight and, and don't be silenced because if we move in that direction of being silenced, we will lose America as a country. So thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions and uh, and hang out with you all. Great. What a what a nice uh, discussion. We have a little bit of time for questions. We have a microphone. Oh, Jeannie's got the mic. It's Jeannie O'Connor from Claire Booth Lewis. Here, would you wait for the mic here? Oh. I can tell you gossip, too, if you want any gossip. <laughs> <laughs> Except don't ask me about Bill O'Reilly, okay? Ooh. No, I'm kidding. We'll wait till we get a sandwich in our hands, and then we'll all sit down. Um, I wanted to tell you how I knew that Trump was going to win. I bought a little pin about the size of a quarter, and it said 2016. I wore it every day. 
from August until the election. Wow. And women would sort of sidle up beside me, wherever I was, Costco, Nordstrom's, you know, changing room, beside me. And under their breath, they'd say, I like your pin. Yeah. And then we did a secret handshake. And, then, <laughs> but, and that happened to me often. And men who can't just come up to a, a woman and say anything, they would look at my pin and they'd look at me and smile. Yeah. And this happened every day, all day. And the number of also that I had African Americans who would say to me, why are you voting for Trump? And I, I had three reasons. One, th jobs, jobs, and jobs. Yeah. I think if men have jobs, if people, anybody who wants a good paying job can have a job, a lot of problems are going to go away. Right. And I think, I think the messaging was key for Trump. I think because he yes. was so brutally honest about it. I yes. think that when Hillary became, her messaging became about um, just personal attacks on Trump and, you know, it didn't work. I mean, she, no. they had no economic message. No. None at all. Like Trump's, from a messaging standpoint, make America great again, America first. It's red, right, and blue. It sells. And it sells especially in those communities who, as he did so brilliantly, talk about the forgotten man and woman, mm -hmm. where they feel that they have been left behind in Obama's economy and Obama's, uh, you know, regulated state. And, and I think, I, I do worry, though. I think we won very narrowly. I, I, it's very hard to pull that off a second time. Mm -hmm. And he really needs to have the legislative agenda items checked off. We need to really see this economy grow. We really need to see these jobs come back uh, because it's going to be very, I mean, we, ha we he ran against a really, really awful candidate. I have a second question. Are you going to be involved at all in the new Cuba? Is that something you would like to? Hmm. I, don't, I haven't thought about it. I, I, my little dream um, is I'd love to do a documentary over there. That would be what I would love to do. Um, I think that's about it. I don't know. I, you know, they. I haven't been asked on the on the new Cuba stuff. Uh, they have very good people there, like Mauricio Claver Carrón, who's uh, who's was part of a U.S. Cuba pack here, and, and is is just a staunch conservative. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have more of the dream of of telling the story. I think I would like to do that at some point. You know, and people ask me, would you ever go back to Cuba? Like, you know, a lot of people are now going. They're so excited, and you know, the younger Cuban generation, they go and they visit all these places. I'm not going to give a dime to the communists. I'm not going to give a dime to them. You know, they took everything of my family. I'm not going to go there. I have no need. I'm going to go there so they can tell me that America's bad. No, thank you. So when Raul Castro dies and when, you know, we'll see what happens in terms of if they ever decide to really open up. I mean, this is the, 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 the fallacy of, of Cuba, is that they say, oh, we're going to open up, we're going to, you know, trade. You know who gets all the money? I mean, over 93 cents to the dollar goes to the Cuban government. They get the money. And then they kind of disperse it in rations to people in terms of food. You don't go to a grocery store to get food. If you're a Cuban person in Cuba right now, you literally have to go with a little list and say, okay, you get one gallon of milk for the whole month. And then you maybe get half a chicken. And then you get a couple eggs to feed a family of seven. It's ridiculous. And, 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 and what do they do? They suppress their people so their people can't live can't be thinking about anything else except food. They can't be thinking about changing the Cuban government if you're trying to feed your family and you're hungry. That's what the Cuban government does. And so I think it's, it's, it's a joke when I hear this idea that this opening up trade will solve the Cuban problem or the fact that the only concession that President Obama made was the fact that, okay, you release 50, you know, Cuban political prisoners and we'll switch off, you know, uh, and we'll lighten up on the trade and on the travel. Well, in that year alone, after they released the 50, hundreds of Cubans have been thrown into jail again. It's a farce. So I want to see real change in Cuba. If I start seeing steps in the right direction where individuals can go and speak freely, where you could really see capitalism and economic growth take place in Cuba, I'm completely open to, you know, opening up the embargo. But the way it's the, it is set up right now, it's the way it's been set up for the pa over fa past 50 years in Cuba. While well, you're on Cuba, I was going to ask you about that. Your family who was born there, right? how do they feel about the prospects for freedom, not going and visiting now, but for a free Cuba like it used to be? Are they optimistic at all? No. No. Uh, sorry, Michelle. Um, no, dad is great. Dad's 82, 81 now, and he's, I love him. And I always say, dad, would you go back? Like, let's say it really frees up. He goes, no, I'm an American. 
very proud. He loves America more than anything else. He loves America over Cuba. This is his home. This is where he wants to be. And, uh, and he always says that I don't think they, I don't think the world really understands. It was like when Fidel Castro died and the Prime Minister Trudeau from Canada made these ridiculously stupid, I'm not going to curse, comments on, um, on Fidel Castro praising the dictator. And it's just they really don't know the reality. I mean, my father was thrown into solitary confinement naked in a room for, for in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a small, tiny building for two months. I mean, they executed his friends. I mean, it was, it was torture after torture, which I didn't find out until I was much older. He would not talk about it with me until he was much older, until I was much older. And so they're not optimistic because they feel that, uh, first of all, you had so many of the Cubans who were the uh, the economic power of Cuba, move over to Miami and build that city. But it's because you've had, you've lost generations. You've lost generations of individuals being able to really experience freedom. And so I'm not, there's plenty of heroes in Cuba uh, who fight every day and, 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 and they get thrown into jail f all the time for even like writing the name Castro on a pig. I mean, you know, it's, but but we're seeing this happen in Venezuela too. The protests that are happening in Venezuela, the, the poverty that Venezuelans are experiencing. They went from being, a, they're an oil producing company. They were thriving, they were rich. And what did it take? It took a government, Hugo Chavez, to change it. And so I think you really have to understand the delicacy of our democracy. It is fragile. We have a better system set up in the sense of checks and balances and the fact that you have Congress checking up on the executive branch, the judicial branch. But it's why it's so critical to keep these checks and balances in check. It is why you were, I was so nervous of a Hillary Clinton winning because I thought, oh my goodness, we could see up to three liberal justices on the Supreme Court where that means that my kids who go to Catholic school and who, uh, or, or where I go to church, where they could go after our religious liberties. They could go after our Second Amendment. I mean, it was nerve wracking for me. And so I do believe in miracles because I do believe in God's intercession in this election. I'm very clear. There were so many prayer chains going on. I can't even tell. I mean, it was novena after novena and the um, novena after novena, I say it in Spanish, after the, you know, during that time, because it was this fear that what we knew in America was going to change because you would have these activist judges basically legislating from the bench. And that's what we have seen during these past eight years. And what are we gonna see right now? We're gonna see Democrats take everything that President Obama does, as we're seeing in sanctuary cities and the temporary travel ban, and shove it through the judicial branch to slow everything down. And they hope to God that for them that it's gonna be a one-term presidency. Hi, my name is Kate Morgan. I'm actually um, an events assistant here at Heritage. And so thank you so much for coming. And I just wanted to ask, what do you, how do you see it changing in Cuba? How do you see the change happening? I've actually been to Cuba for a mission trip about 10 years ago. It's even probably different than what it was um, then, but the poverty, the things that I saw, the rationing of a family who had, you know, two girls and there was four of them and they got barely anything for a whole month and they were being even supported by people in the United States from their families here. So how do you see it changing? Um, because I mean, yes, the um, political signage, the things that, you know, you see around a whole generation thinks and knows about this, you know, has lived in this way. And so they're used to it or they've, you know, that's how they've, you know, come to know life. And so right. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what, like, how do we change this lost generation that, you know, now sees it as, you know, an everyday thing? You know, I think everything is possible because you look at what happened in Eastern Europe when it was the fall of communism or, for example, in, you know, you look at East Germany and when that whole situation happened and the Berlin Wall fell. And I, th and I do think that the innate nature of human beings, they seek freedom. I do believe that. Um, but I also do believe that there are those corrupt factors in place when, when you have a military that is so powerful, like in Cuba, where they're the ones that have free access to get what they get. They're cushy, they're taken care of, and then you have the informants who are watching over the communities to figure out who's misbehaving and, and who's, you know, who's, who's speaking up against the Cuban government, and they're taken care of. So, um, you know, I, I believe that it, when Raul Castro dies, it will be an end of an era for, for, for Cuba in that sense, for that Cuban government, because the Castros represent so much of what they have. Now, they already have their next person in line. 
you know, a younger individual, he's in his 30s. Um, and so we might not see enough of that change. It would really have to take a resistance, a res I don't even want to use that word, in within Cuba to make that substantial change. And so that's, it's going to be critical. I, I mean, Trump get it? Uh, I think Trump, that's a really good question. I think Trump wants to, if he likes to make the deal. So he wants to have a deal where the fact that they have to make fundamental changes in Cuba for, for the U.S. to want to talk to them. So I think he understands that component of it. Um, you know, but I, I have to say, I don't think he's necessarily right now, like he's got bigger fish to fry right now in that sense. And I do think, you know, like the mission work, I think in Cuba, you know, it, it's, that's very important to have that exchange because then I think they're able to see the other side of what the American experience is. Um, I think what you're seeing also, and this is something interesting that's been happening in Miami, those individuals, some of them come to Cuba, they stay for a year. <laughs> And then they get the benefits of the United States, and then they go back to Cuba. So it's, it's, are you like, are you kidding me? Seriously? So you come and you want to take advantage of our system here and then go back? So, I, it, you know, I think it's, I don't, I'm not as optimistic. I just am not as an optimistic, but you never know. I mean, you never know if there's just really that growth and that resistance to be able to push back, but or that there's enough economic pressure placed on the regime after Raul Castro dies to say, all right, let's just try to make some significant changes so we can really have trade. I mean, think about it. They've been trading with Europe for, for a long time, and you have not seen any substantial change in Cuba. Really. I mean, you just haven't. You're just seeing now more American tourists going over, going on the cruises while the Cubans tell them how bad the Americans are. This is what they do. Because only the ones that are like the Cuban that had the cruises and stuff like that. I had one guy who told me the story. It's like he spent his time just bashing America. I'm like, that's not a vacation. I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> All right, last one, quick question here. I'm Ann Canfield. Thank you very, very much for coming. And back on North Korea, how do you see this playing out? I mean, it's there's a real back and forth going on. Obviously, I think the president had a very good meeting with Xi. They've developed a good, they have a good, seem to have a very good relationship. Xi is also in a very tenuous position, yeah. you know, internally in China. So how, where, how do you see this playing out? Because I, I, I think actually the North Korean, you know, whatever his name is, I think he's very, very clever. You know, I, I think he's, he's dangerously not, he's, clever. Yes, I mean, that's yes. the problem. And his aunt behind him. <laughs> and so it's, I think I think he's very, very clever. So I was reading this uh, story about a, li a North Korean who, I, who somehow managed to get out, and he explained how at the schools they show pictures of American soldiers at, during the time of the Korean War basically killing North Koreans, right? So it was like killing North Korean pregnant women. So they send a very negative message about America, just to start from there. And so they're, because they have, their media is controlled by the state, because they really have no access to the outside world or very little access to the outside world, I mean, their world is, is tiny. They don't, they, they can't understand that. You know, what's, what capitalism means, what it means to prosper, they don't understand the, necessarily don't understand those concepts. I think, look, I think you're seeing Rex Tillerson going over to the United Nations. I really believe the United Nations is useless, Stu. You know, they passed over six resolutions trying to ban coal uh, exports, they, their minerals. They, they've done so many trying to push for some of these economic sanctions. It's not working. Uh, so I think you can go over and go talk fancy with the ambassadors. I don't think we're going to get going to get anything done there. I do think that, and I'm pleasantly surprised. I'm very cautious on the Chinese, but I'm pleasantly surprised that the president is has taken the strong initiative of bringing in the Chinese and, and the Chinese president and developing that relationship and saying, look, buddy, you got to help me here because otherwise I'm going to do this on my own. Because I think that China has, has surprisingly made some interesting steps, which is they didn't allow them to come in with a coal from North Korea. They banned, they stopped them. They told them to take the coal back because of one of the tests that they had over the, you know, the sea, in, over the sea of Japan. And so I think that it's... Um, they're sending these messages to North Korea. Mike, what I'm concerned about is that North Korea then, it's almost like they become the bigger bully. Like they're like, then they threaten to have like a super preemptive military strike against the United States. I mean, they are, 
you know, th we think that like President Trump like can exaggerate sometimes. I mean, they are overly blowing, exaggerating everything. Um, so I really think we just don't know what we're dealing with. And I don't think there's a, in any way a simple solution to North Korea. You know, I think it is putting more financial uh, pressure on them uh, in terms of limiting like their you know, offshore currency reserve or their income. I think that there's things you can do. Will that effectively change that government? No, they're going to continue building their nuclear capability. Either you take out the, their ability to build nuclear weapons or I just don't see how they're going to stop doing what they're doing. I mean, sure, you cut them from a financial level, then they can't pay their military, they can't pay their, their intelligence officers, but is it going to be enough? These guys are determined. They want to be a nuclear superpower. They're going to move in that direction, and I just don't think China has enough oomph to stop them. Thank you so much. And if, you, if Bridget doesn't agree with me or Michelle, no, 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 no. we have some no. little gifts for you.